every voice, sing every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be his glory. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and possessions, your name stands above them all. Holy, all creation cries. Holy. 
nothing else we can do but give you all the glory. Lord, you, we praise you for this new morning, for this new day. Uh, God, we lift up to you and dedicate to you our lives, and I pray that um, the words that you'll be speaking to us today, may it may it uh, dwell in us, God. May, may we receive it 
uh, wholeheartedly and willingly. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and it's all this we say in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys may be seated. Good morning, church. I'm Jonathan Swift. If you don't know me, um, I've known you for a long time. I was remarking to um, Christy as we were driving here this morning, and I probably say something like this every time I stand before you. It, it feels like coming home when we come here, and Part of that is just how long we've been connected with Fellowship Bible Church. We were thinking this, the next year, 2025, will make will mark 20 years that we've been in some way part of the extended family of Fellowship Bible Church. It's a long time, so I'll, I'll save it for next next year. Yeah, we'll, ne- this was 19 years right now. I mean, it's, it's that's how long we've been connected from when we arrived here. Uh, one summer Sunday and uh, looking for a, a church to call home while we were raising support to go to the Middle East. Then this became our home on our sending church. You prayed for us. You supported us. Uh, we came back and then you were a part of the church plant work in Dearborn with Christ Community Church. Uh, and you've continued through all this time uh, praying for us, being just crazy generous to us uh and and we just counted a a joy and a privilege to be a part of your extended family and now as i serve with word partners training pastors around the world um i i know your prayers continue to go with me and i thank you for that um just thank you thank you um you can be praying for us um we've got some traveling ahead that's part of what i do is i travel to the middle east north africa train pastors in in various different countries but before we do that christy and i are heading to the netherlands in just a few weeks to be with our daughter who is uh about to have our first granddaughter and uh so we're not our first grandchild but our first granddaughter so it's our third grandchild so very excited about that something special about a granddaughter and i um, looking forward to being there with her. And then from there, I'm going to do one of my training trips to uh, Egypt and back. Uh, we're also planning a trip to Greece and back. So anyways, uh, that's kind of our future. I won't spend too much more time talking about that because it's time to dig into the Word of God. Uh, and that's what we're here for at this time in our worship service. Uh, Pastor Johnny had asked me to, um, to launch the the next sermon series which is going through the book of hosea right the gospel of real love uh, that's the title for the sermon series and i'm going to be bringing to you sort of an overall like an overview sermon it's sort of hosea at thirty thousand feet where i, I find myself at thirty thousand feet a lot in my ministry uh, that's what we're going to do the bird's eye view of hosea overview uh, there's going to be a lot of scriptures. I encourage you to open your Bibles to Hosea if you can find it. Uh, it's, it's one of the few little, um, I, see I cheated, I put a bookmark in here. It's one of the, uh, one of the uh, small, uh, what they call the minor prophets. Okay, and you can be looking for that. I'm going to have us uh, open to Hosea 2 first. Um, and let me start off our time together in the Word. Before, before we jump into the text, there's some background stuff that uh, we want to talk about and cover. And, and, but I want to get to the heart of the overall message of Hosea. And then Johnny's going to be taking you through the, the chapter by chapter, part by part, and, uh, and going into the details. So not a, lot of big, not a lot of details this morning, but overview, main themes. Um, let me ask you a question just to kind of get us into the text here. How well, this is just an examination, heart examination question, how well would you say you know God? How well are you coming to know God? 
How, how deeply, here's another question, let's move from no to feel, or no from the mind to the heart. How deeply have you felt God's love? I want us to be thinking about that this morning and then for as many weeks as it takes you to get through Hosea, okay? During the Old Testament era of the kings, and that's when Hosea takes place, the, the, the nation of Israel was actually divided into two nations, and it had been for a while. You had the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, but also sometimes called Samaria, and sometimes called Ephraim, so it's a little confusing. But those three names are given to the northern kingdom. And the southern kingdom was called Judea, or Judah. So you had Judah, and you had the northern kingdom called Israel, sometimes Ephraim, sometimes Samaria. In the prophets, you hear it called all those things. Um, and that's what Hosea is dealing with, mainly with the northern kingdom and where they are in terms of their knowledge of God and their understanding of the love of God. The problem is that the northern kingdom, I'll just call it Israel, okay, the northern kingdom of Israel, had totally forgotten God and had completely rejected his love. At the time of the prophet Hosea, the king at the time, it was named Jeroboam, and we call him Jeroboam II because he's the second king in the, in the story of First and Second Kings to be named Jeroboam. The first one was right after Solomon. This is many generations after that. So he's Jeroboam II. He was king of Israel, and he led the people to reject, to despise, to abandon, and to replace the Lord with idols. And yet, Israel was a people that the Lord had formed himself. He had chosen them. He had loved them. He had delivered them. He had provided for them, and he had made promises for their future. So God was in this place where he had to judge the ones he loved. And he did this by compelling the tyrannical Assyrian Empire to come and destroy Israel and then carry the survivors after the destruction, survivors off into exile. That was the punishment that was being predicted for the future if they kept on the path that they were in their rejection of God and forgetting God and not understanding his love. But the exile would be just for a time. God's ultimate plan was not simply for judgment. It wasn't simply to punish them. His ultimate plan was for restoration, to restore his people, because God deeply loved them. He deeply desired to restore the relationship between his people and himself because of his steadfast love and his inexhaustible mercy. And we hear about that over and over again in Hosea. Hosea says, if the people would only remember, if they'd only really knew who God truly is and, and remember all that he has done for them, then they would return to him. How well do you know God this morning? How deeply have you felt his love today? To better understand the prophecy of Hosea, it will help us to remember the kind of relationship that God had with his people. Okay, he had a special kind of relationship with his people. And then it also will help us remember what role the prophet, like Hosea, had in those Old Testament times. Okay, so first, so here's some background material before we get into the text. First, the relationship. What kind of relationship did God have with his people? Well, we say that God's relationship with Israel was covenantal. What does that mean? Well, a covenant is a special relationship that God initiates with his people. All the main covenants in the Bible between God and his people have three parts. And I think we have a slide for this. There's three parts to every covenant that you will read. The main covenants you read about in the Bible, they have three parts. And it's kind of they don't always have it like cut down like this, broken down very clearly. Sometimes you have to look for these elements, but they're there. Okay. First, a covenant will start where God tells the people 
how, uh, about his grace and his deliverance. So, like, for instance, think of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. It starts out saying, I am the Lord God who delivered you out of Egypt. That's God's deliverance. That's God's grace. This is who I am. This is the history we've had. And you can trust me. And so the response to that from the people is supposed to be faith or trust in all that God is for them and has done for them. Okay? Then... Every covenant has some kind of command or section of commands to it, like the Ten Commandments in Exodus. You have the Ten Commands there, right? Well, uh, what, what's that for? Well, if the people are supposed to respond to those commands, how? In obedience, but not just sort of like outward obedience. It's supposed to be from loving obedience from the heart, okay? So you have a heart obedience to his commandments, that's, so it's love. It's really a response to love. Jesus would say later, right, if you love me, keep my commands. Right? Those are not two different things. To love someone is to keep, to love God is to keep his commands. Okay, it's a, an expression of love. Then finally, there's always in every covenant warnings for breaking the covenant of curses and then promises of blessing if you keep the covenant, okay, which people are, they're supposed to fear in a reverent way, supposed to fear the warnings of curses, and they're supposed to hope for the blessings as a result of being in a covenant relationship with God. And you see these three elements in every main covenant in the Bible. Another covenantal relationship we see in the Bible is something you're probably more familiar with, and that's the marriage covenant, right? The covenantal relationship we see between a husband and a wife. And it's no coincidence then, and this is launches us into the text here, that part one of Hosea, which is chapters one through three, we see God introducing his warning to his disobedient people with a living prophetic parable, okay, like a, like a living story in Hosea's marriage. Like he actually uses Hosea's marriage and his family to speak a message to his people. He uses the covenant of marriage, Hosea's marriage specifically, to speak about his covenant relationship with his whole people. All right. And so we're going to look at Hosea in these two parts. One, Israel has broken covenant with God, but God will redeem them. That's chapters one through three. And then the rest of it from four all the way to 14. How has Israel broken covenant and what is God going to do about it? Okay. so back to part one. Israel has broken covenant with God, but God will redeem them. Okay, like I said, Hosea's marriage and family life actually becomes a picture of God's word to Israel. It makes us a little bit uncomfortable to read this, but that's what God's doing. And it is powerful, it is effective. God instructs Hosea to take a prostitute named Gomer to be his wife. She then has three children, and she's to name the children with symbolic names. The first child's name is, it's Jezreel, which means God will sow, like a, like a sower, a, like a farmer, okay, sowing seeds. The next name, the next child is called No Mercy, and then the third child is called Not My People, and this is to show Israel that they have become the object of God's wrath. Because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry. God will sow judgment for breaking the covenant. He will no longer show them mercy, and Israel is going to be cut off from being God's people. Not surprisingly, Gomer later cheats on Hosea. And then, surprisingly, God tells, this is in chapter 3, God tells Hosea to go and get her, and redeem her by paying all of her debts and bring her back home to be his wife again. I'll tell you what, it's an unnerving story. It's a sad story of a broken marriage covenant. It's, a, it's actually heart-wrenching to put yourself into Hosea's shoes and imagine the pain that his heart's going through. But God does that on purpose. He does it to show us with heart-wrenching pain and suffering at an eternally higher level 
how the Lord loves his people with a steadfast and suffering love. It also introduces us to this tension that we see in the heart of God. God must punish his adulterous, unfaithful people according to the covenant rules, according to the covenant curses. They will be put away from him for a time. But then God loves his people and he deeply longs in love to restore them, to bring them back, to redeem them in his good timing. That's one thing that we need to understand going into this, this kind of strange prophecy. It's also going to help us to remember what the role of the prophet was. What, what, was, what was Hosea's job as an Old Testament prophet in ancient Israel? Well, a faithful prophet functioned kind of like a prosecuting attorney. The job of the prosecuting attorney in a court of law, like, you know, just like today, is to show that the accused is guilty by holding up their actions to the light of the law, right? Here's the law, here's what you did, you're guilty. In Israel's case, at the time of Hosea, the people had completely forgotten all of the commandments and all the requirements of the covenant God had made with them through Moses. I mean, way back at the time of Moses. Hosea's marriage, uh, or I'm sorry, his message, is that Israel is guilty. Like, he's the prosecuting attorney. Israel, you are guilty. Here's God's law according to the covenant that you agreed to, that you entered into with God, and you are wrong. So his message repeatedly calls the people to face their deserved punishment, to fess up to their guilt, and repent and return to the Lord. But unlike a prosecuting attorney in a court of law today, the Old Testament uh, prophet also revealed the loving heart of God for his people. So the message of, of Hosea, as you'll see as you read through it, is also full of deep, powerful, complex emotion. One moment God's word of judgment is delivered with harsh wrath and disturbing language, but then it's immediately followed by words of deep care and, and affection and promises of love and restoration. Over and over again, we hear God's agonizing heartache from the experience of rejection by those whom he created, those he delivered, those he loved immensely. So, in part one, of Hosea chapters 1 through 3, God is saying that he is Israel's true husband. That's the message there. He is Israel's true husband. Now, go to the next slide. I think we've got that there. Oh, I guess I didn't put it up there. But this is the, this is, this is the passage of, of, um, of his responding to their rejection of him. Okay, Though Israel has acted adulterously like adulterously and idolatrously right they've committed adultery in a sense as a people from god but they've also done that through idolatry worshiping idols and they deserve the curses of breaking the covenant and even though god will bring those curses upon them by leading them off uh, off of their land and into assyrian exile god isn't done with them look what he says here in chapter 2 verses 16 so this is after the marriage picture of Hosea, chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. I'm going to read this for us. This is God's word for God's people. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. And no longer will you call me my Baal, or Baal, which is an a idol, okay? For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by my name, by uh, they, oh, the, the, the Baals will be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know 
the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel, or God will sow. And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall be, say, you are my God. Full restoration. Like the adultery had never happened. Betrothed once again. Like a perfect spotless bride. So even though Israel has been unfaithful to God. God's not going to play the part of the spurned husband and go, you know, be all mad and just reject her forever. Instead, God will betroth them to himself in righteousness, like she'll be holy again, in justice. He will do this in some way that his, he upholds his justice. Right? He's not just going to overlook the law. He's not going to overlook the judgments of the curses of the covenant. He's going to do this in justice somehow. And he'll do it in steadfast love and in mercy. And at this point in Hosea, we start going, how's he going to do that? Like, how's he going to do both? How's he going to judge them and restore and love them at the same time? And that's the tension that we see in God's heart through Hosea. The Lord is Israel's true husband he will bring her back he will redeem her and as we walk through hosea today i want to invite you i want you, i want to invite you to, to something that maybe is uncomfortable to actually wince in heartache along with god over his people's unfaithfulness in the face of god's relentless love his unbounded mercy and his abounding grace and as we do, we shouldn't be surprised to find ourselves maybe reflecting on our own hearts and our own bent towards waywardness in the face of all that God is for us, all God has done for us, all that he has spoken to us according to his unfailing, abounding, steadfast love. Today, you are invited to truly know the one true God, and to turn to the one who loves you more than you could possibly know. I think that's what the message of Hosea is about. To, he's calling his people to truly know the one true God and turn to the one who loves you more than you could possibly know. And now let's look at the rest of uh, Hosea's prophecy in part two, which is basically just the rest of the book. Um, part two how specifically has Israel broken covenant with God? And what's God going to do about it? In part two here of Hosea, we see three main parts. Okay? From chapters four and up, these are just big, broad, thematic parts. Okay? Johnny's going to take you through chapters and parts, you know, smaller parts. But this is the big, broad themes. Okay? From Hosea four to about nine, verse nine. We see God revealing himself as Israel's true king. So in part one, he's Israel's true husband. Here, he's Israel's true king. Israel's glory, in other words, like the focus of their worship. And he's the true lawgiver. Like his word, his commands are law, but they're also life-giving. Okay, that's what God's word's about. And he's all these things. Then in, in the next section, chapter 9, verse 10 to 11, 12, that's the end of 11, uh, God is Israel's true father. And as a father, an, an ancient times father would also be probably a fa like a farmer and a shepherd. Or he would take care of animals and he would understand fields. So that, that's all wrapped up. We see those themes together. Uh, God's just, just uh, revealing himself as father, who's also kind of farmer and shepherd as well. And then in the last part, we see from chapter 12 to the end, God is Israel's true savior. He alone is the one who rescues them and delivers them out of their troubles, okay? So let's walk through these parts. Uh, the first part, Hosea uh, 4 to 9. Hosea shows how God is Israel's true king, Israel's true glory, like the, the true focus of their worship, and their only lawgiver. His word 
is given to them, and his word brings life. Why does God emphasize these things about himself or these themes about himself in this part of the, of the message of Hosea? It's because Israel had set up evil kings for themselves, right? They didn't have godly kings like King David was. They have evil kings ruling them. And also their priests. Their priests were actually, were they, were, they were supposed to be leading people into the worship of the one true God at the temple down in Jerusalem, but actually their priests were making idols with their own hands and leading the people to worship idols instead. And also, the people were listening to, to false prophets, false words, false laws, not the rules of God, but false things from the prophets, false prophets. And as a result of these three offices, the kings, the priests, and the prophets, all leading the people away from God, uh, as a result, they came as a people to lack true knowledge of who God is. They didn't know who God was anymore. They were all confused. In Hosea 4, 6, God cries out, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. So there's the judgment part, right? So God, he brings us indictment against the priests. In other places, we see it directly against the prophets. Other places, directly against the kings in this section. And it's all because they were the ones, actually all three of those, the kings, the priests, and the prophets, were all supposed to be working together to lead the people to the Lord and to help them understand God better, to know the Lord. To know who he was and what he'd done and what he promised to do in the future. But they were all leading the people away from the Lord. And so instead of enjoying the covenant blessings and looking forward to that in hope, they should be, as Hosea's message is saying, they should be looking forward to the judgment and reverent fear. We get a little bit of the uh, scene from uh, Second Kings chapter 14, which tells us a little bit about Jeroboam the second's rule it says in the 15th year of Amaziah the son of Joash king of Judah that's the southern kingdom Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel that's the northern kingdom began to reign in Samaria there you see it. it's called Samaria that's the northern kingdom and he reigned 41 years now listen to this and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord he wasn't the first one he was in a succession of many evil kings and he did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat which he made Israel to sin who's Who's Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? Well, he's actually the first Jeroboam. So he's Jeroboam 1. If this is Jeroboam 2 at the time of Hosea, there was another Jeroboam before. And he was right just one generation, one king after Solomon. That's when the kingdom's broken half. And he was in the north. And you know what he did? He's the one who built two golden calves. Talk about like going backwards. Two golden calves up in Samaria, up in the northern kingdom, because he didn't want his people up in the northern kingdom going down to the southern kingdom in Jerusalem to worship the temple. He says, oh, now worship these golden calves up here and call them Yahweh, the name that God gave to, to Moses to call him by. Here's the God who delivered you out of Egypt, pointing to these calves. And so what we're seeing from 2 Kings 14 is that this later, generations and generations later, this second king, Je uh, Jeroboam, is, is like revived the cult of the calves up north. And everybody's worshiping, again, these idols. But God promises that he will reestablish his kingship again. His word will come forth. True word, not the false words of the prophets. He will, again, be the center of their worship. Um, in Hosea 3, 5, God says, afterward, so like after he brings them back or after their exile, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Now, how's he going to do that? And who's this David? Hold on to that. We'll get back to it later. Okay. Uh, we'll see it in a moment. But first, but first, this announcement. No, but first, in the next section... Hosea chapter 9 through 11, 12. God shows Israel that he is their true father. Okay, so he's their true husband. He's their true king. He's their true glory. He's their true lawgiver. And here, 
He's their true father in this next section. That's what, this is a broad theme we see here. And like I said, in ancient times, a good father was usually also a good farmer. This is how God reveals himself in this section of, of Hosea. But like a rebellious son, Israel has abandoned their father. And like a field of bad soil, they didn't produce the fruit of obedience and love and righteousness that God required. But the Lord will not give up on his son. And that's what we read in this somewhat famous verse from chapter 11 of Hosea. We, we read it in Matthew at Christmas time. Okay. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Just park right there. I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But look what they did. Verse 2, the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Do you see the heart-wrenching contrast? You love your child, and he just rebels against you, runs off, calls somebody else mom and dad. God reminds them that he's always been their good father. And he will deliver them out of their disobedience now, once again, like he did back in Egypt at the time of Moses. And then God cries out again. This is a little bit later in chapter 11. He says, here, I want you to hear God's heart here. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. This is God speaking. My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Like, he's like a father, but like a lion, roaring. And his children shall come trembling from the west. They'll hear his voice. They'll come trembling like birds from Egypt. And, they'll, and like doves and from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. Notice there, he says, I'm not going to execute my wrath. And I think what he means is forever. Because they are going to Assyria. They are going to Egypt. They are going to exile, from which he's going to call them back as a father. God in his steadfast love promises to make them his son again. How will he do it? I keep asking that question. I keep putting it off. Before we answer that question, look at the last section. Hosea 12 to 14, just the end part, okay? We've seen God as Israel's true husband. God as true king, true object of their glory and worship, true word or lawgiver. He's also the true father and here. He's also Israel's true savior in this section at the end. But Israel has turned to other saviors. Hosea 12.1 opens up the section like this. Ephraim, again the northern kingdom, Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. They multiply fa falsehood and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. What that means is that Israel has made political alliances political covenants with these pagan nations that they fear instead of fearing god and looking to him to deliver them they're actually making covenants with the big bad enemy hoping that that'll save them now to make a covenant with a pagan idol worshiping assyrian nation to provide for them deliverance and protection was treason it's treason against God and his covenant. Because God is their all in all. Why do they need to go to Assyria? Why do they need to make a bargain with Egypt? They're turning to human solutions to their problems that only God can fix. But God, once again, in his mercy, I mean, do you see how limitless his mercy is? He calls Israel to return, and he says he will heal them. He will love them. He will st restore them and flourish them under his protection. He, he's their savior. And in chapter 13, he recounts all that he did from the time that he called Jacob and, and led them uh, 
in and out of slavery in the, in the whole Exodus story. And he talks about how he's with them in the wilderness. He's never let them go. He's always been their savior. And then at the end, chapter 14, verses 2 and 4, he even gives them words to pray and say for when they come back. Like here, here's what you're going to say. And say it and, and recite this. He says, take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, in other words, say these words to me. When you come back, take away all our iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will say no more our God to the work of our hands, the idols, right? I will heal their apostasy, God says. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. Finally, in the very last verse of Hosea, verse 9 of chapter 14, Hosea like goes from like prophet to sage. He, he gives us a little word of wisdom. It sounds like the Proverbs. He says, whoever is wise... Let him understand these things, like meaning the whole thing, the whole book. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. I could have been taken right out of, out of Proverbs. Now, the question that I keep kind of like teasing you with, how? How is God going to do this? How will God... First of all, how will God heal his broken heart over his people? How will the Lord justly execute the judgment of his covenant and also love his people with a steadfast love and restore them? It just seems like that's impossible to do both. Now, remember from chapter 3 what we read. Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord, and to the goodness of the latter days. Okay, end times. What is this, what is this, this latter days? Why, why king, king David? He's been dead for generations and generations at this time. Well, we know the, we know the rest of the story, right? We know that the rest of the Bible tells us that Jesus is the future King David that was promised to ancient Israel. Well, we see that at Christmas time all over the place, right? When Gabriel announces to Mary, telling her that she's going to have the Son of the Most High and he will sit on David's throne and reign in righteousness, right? And all over the place. When Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, he, he tells that David's gone, but Jesus, he's the new King David. We see that all over the New Testament. And this future David, future for Hosea, Right, Jesus, he's the one who will lead God's people back to true knowledge of the one true God. Jesus completes Hosea's prophecy by fulfilling all that God promised through Hosea. True restoration after the exile comes only through Jesus. And that's what the beginning of Matthew and, and Luke is all about. Right? They quote from this era of prophets all through Christmas time. Right? Jesus is the one who comes to complete the story. The New Testament tells us Jesus is the true bridegroom to his people, right? The church, his bride, who will wash her with his word and present her to himself, or present her to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle holy and without blemish you can read about that in, in in ephesians chapter 5 the gospels testify that jesus is our one true king that he's the focus of our worship that he perfectly kept all of god's commands and he brings the word he is the word living and incarnate in the person of jesus god spoke from heaven at Jesus' baptism that jesus is the true son of the father and Jesus taught that only in him can we become God's adopted children. He's the only way to the Father. And Jesus is the only true Savior from our real enemies. And our enemies isn't Assyria, and it's no nation on earth. Our real enemies are sin, death, and Satan. And that's who he delivers us from. How does Jesus do all these wonderful things? How does he, how does he, how is he? How is it that he can be all these wonderful things for us? 
Jesus has fulfilled Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3. Let me read that for you, right from the middle of the book. Come, let us return to the Lord. Why? For he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down that he will build us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. He is going, his going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers and the spring rains that water the earth. The Lord gave these words to Israel through Hosea over 700 years before Jesus came. Words to say, words to pray in faith until God's wrath would somehow be satisfied and he would somehow restore them and raise them up again. And ultimately, we know this, Israel could not sufficiently pay for her own sins. She could not pay for her adultery against her bridegroom, her husband. She could not pay for her treason against her king. She could not pay for her idolatrous rejection of her glory. She could not pay for her disobedience to the Lord's commands and her rejection of her true father and distrust of her only savior. Instead, the Lord required a perfect son, a perfect king, Jesus, who had to stand in their place to receive their punishment to die on the cross bearing all the weight of their sin, bearing all the grief and all the wrath of God. But then in his suffering love, he would conquer sin and death and Satan, their true enemies. And he would rise up on the third day so that on the last day, he could raise us all up as his faithful bride and invite us into eternal his eternal presence holy, blameless, adopted as children. Do you truly know the Lord who has saved you? Do you know the one who has loved you more than you could possibly know, who loved you through Jesus? Israel could not pay for her sins, and we cannot pay for ours. We can't. Hosea shows us that a lack of knowledge of the Lord leads to idolatry in the heart, which leads to seeking for human solutions to problems that only God can fix. Israel ceased to know their God and all that he had done for them. They'd forgotten. Not remembering how God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, Israel turned to the pagan nations of Jeroboam's day for political deliverance instead of God. I wonder... Does our lack of knowledge of God lead us to look for human solutions to unbelieving politicians or to material comforts to deliver us from our problems and unhappiness that only God can deliver us from through Jesus? Idolatry can be subtle. Israel worshipped idols and they called those idols by the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Right? They they. They also gave credit of all the covenant blessings of Yahweh to those idols instead of God. And they also called the Lord by the names of idols. They were all mixed up. We must examine our hearts. We got to make sure we're not constructing false images of who God is and then project it onto him and worship that instead of who he really is. We have to examine our hearts and Make sure that we're not calling human solutions to our problems by the name of God. How do we make sure? Because it can be subtle. We turn away from looking to people and things to be for us what only Christ can be for us. Right? We love our spouses, but we don't look to them to be our deliverance. Right? We vote for the right politician, but we don't look, for them, look to them for salvation. And the, and the solution to all our problems. Our hope is not in them. Our hope is in Christ and Christ alone. We turn away from looking to these things. We turn again and again to Jesus, our bridegroom, our priest, our prophet, our king, the way to the Father and our only Savior. We grow in our heart knowledge. We work on it. We, we understand his word and we know who God is. We grow in that. And we do that through the word through worship, and through prayer. So the invitation stands. 
Come, turn to the Lord, for he has torn Jesus on your behalf that he may heal you. He has struck down Jesus and he will bind you up. Only in Jesus will we be raised up on that last day. And in the words of Hosea 6, let us know, let us press on to truly know the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would indeed help us to do so. Where we are ignorant of who you truly are, Father, we ask that you would reveal who you are to us by your word and the spirit. Lord, that we would know who you are and worship you for who you are. Lord, that we would take time daily to remember who you are and all that you've done for us, first in Christ, but then also all these blessings you've given us. Even in difficult times, Lord, your promise is for restoration. One day we will be with you forever. One day we will be spotless before you. One day our sins will all be gone. They're forgiven now, but one day they'll be gone and we'll be spotless before you. Lord, help us to hope in that day, to remember, to look forward to that day in hope. And remember what it, help us to remember what it costs to bring us home. Thank you, Lord, for your justice, but also your deep, deep love, compassion, and mercy for us, which you demonstrated for us in Jesus on the cross. Amen. Uh, good morning, church. Uh, just got a couple announcements. Um, the, we have some announcements in the upcoming in the bulletin. It says upcoming at the top. Uh, just want to do a little caveat for uh, Gary Gulick's mor uh, memorial service, though. Uh, the hospitality committee is asking for uh, desserts to be brought uh, from the uh, congregants uh, to the service for that. Uh, so, if you have any questions about that, see my wife Jill Forster. And then uh, <clears throat> I want to announce um, some individuals that will be getting voted on uh, next Sunday for uh, Covenant Partnership. Uh, it's, it's what we call for uh, uh, members. Uh, Jesse Tanagato, uh, Dennis Osborne, Tom Schoenfelter, uh, Bob and Madeline Wright, and John and Sheba Cook. So we've got a lot of people that uh, are... Uh, needing to get the, the vote taken care of, and uh, we'll do that next week, uh, next Sunday. So, and then uh, the last uh, announcement I have is, if you haven't noticed already, uh, on your way out, take a look at our sign. We, uh, we have, uh, our, our sign is now updated with our name. So uh, it's been a long time coming. So take a look at that. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it may be a new name, but it's still the same God. Uh, Jonathan? I close? Let me just pray a, a blessing over us as we leave. Our Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would send us out as your true children. Help us to seek to know you more deeply. Not just about you, but to know you, to know your heart, and to experience your love, and to walk in that love, and to walk as people who have been transformed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to take as many people as we can with us to be at that wedding feast that you promised one day to us. In Jesus' name, amen.